Hey everyone, welcome to The Drive Podcast. I'm your host, Peter Atia. Peter, welcome to another AMA. How are you doing? Doing very well. We got a topic you're really excited about, I think, today. I am, yeah. I do I do find this topic to be uh, simultaneously interesting and important, so glad we're doing it. That's always a good overlap. So for today's podcast, for those of you listening and watching, and what we're going to do is answer questions that have come through from subscribers around recent topics covered on the podcast, specifically questions around hormone replacement therapy and testosterone replacement therapy as it relates to women. So this is a topic that's been talked about on the Joanne Manson episode, Sharon Parrish, as well as the Endocrine System podcast where, Peter, you were drawing on a whiteboard. And so from those episodes, we gathered a lot of questions. And these questions really focus around the practical application of HRT and TRT for women and how you use these in your practice with your female patients. So the hope is this is much more of a practical application as opposed to an educational one. And wrapped up in this conversation around HRT is the topic of compounding pharmacies. As many people who will need to get HRT and custom HRT prescriptions will use compound pharmacies. So even if you're not interested in HRT, if you ever think about or will have to use compound pharmacies, it will be a really good discussion. So with all that said, anything you want to add before we get into it? No, again, I think this is, you know, I think sometimes when you talk about something like sex hormones, there's a potential thinking that, oh, you're only speaking to half the population. But of course, um, while everything we're going to talk about is directly applicable to women, uh, it's obviously applicable to men uh, who who sort of know or, or care about women. Um, so, you know, uh, I know more about this topic than my wife, and um, that's going to, I think, help me help her as the as she goes through these transitions and and similarly uh, i think if you're listening to this and you're a guy you know it's it's worth um uh, paying a lot of attention as though we're talking about male hormones as well which of course we spend just as much time talking about and the same argument would apply there as well yeah and i think that kind of leads to a good first question which is even though this is a topic we've covered somewhat extensively in the past why did you kind of feel it was important to touch on hormone replacement therapy again as it relates to women and, you know, pull more questions around this? You know, I just think that this is a very frustrating topic to me. Um, and uh, I don't tend to get as animated about it as I, I used to or as angry about it. But I, I do, uh, I still believe that the, the, the sort of mainstream medical community has committed a, a gross injustice uh, over the past 20 years uh, in the uh, misinterpretation of the Women's Health Initiative and uh, the subsequent demonization of hormones in uh, perimenopausal and postmenopausal therapy for women. And as a result of that, many women have been significantly harmed. Um, you know, the sum total of lives that have been saved due to uh, less breast cancer as a result from the lack of HRT over the past 20 years is exactly zero. Uh, I say that a bit facetiously, but statistically that is true. Let's be clear. There were zero additional deaths uh, due to HRT um, uh, from, from breast cancer. There were more cases, one in a thousand women increase in case, um, but it translated to nothing in deaths. And yet I'm positive we could point to additional deaths due to hip fractures uh, and uh, I, I've discussed some of those elsewhere. Um, and that says nothing about the quality of life that has been compromised. So, you know, we're not going to rehash all of that because it's been, it's been done elsewhere. And as you said, the purpose of this podcast is to, to talk about the logistics of how one goes about replacing hormone replacement therapy and what all of the options are. And believe me, there are a lot of options. So um, we have a lot to cover today. Yeah, and you know, we know there's a broad spectrum of s the severity of symptoms that women will experience in menopausal transition. And because of that, we see a ton of questions come through from subscribers wanting to know how will they know if it's time for them to start considering HRT. So do we know anything about what the tests are that can be done to confirm the onset of menopause? 
Yeah, so menopause is a clinical diagnosis, and technically it's really diagnosed retrospectively. It requires 12 months of amenorrhea, so 12 months of not having a period without any other obvious uh, pathologic or physiologic cause. That said, there are a number of things that we can measure in the blood that um, tell us we're heading there, uh, or frankly, if you just happen to have difficulty um, or for other reasons have um, an inconsistent period, such as the use of an IUD, um, which can interfere with a period, um, these blood tests can be particularly helpful. So really the mainstay of looking at this is is measuring follicle stimulating hormone and to a lesser extent luteinizing hormone but it's really fsh that is perhaps the single most important hormone uh, to look at to get a sense of where a woman is on her trajectory towards menopause now Again, we've covered this in great detail in the video that I made on the subject of hormones. And one of those videos, uh, people might recall, was specifically on female reproductive hormones. Uh, I did one on male reproductive, thyroid, et cetera. Um, we'll link to the video of the female reproductive hormone systems in the show notes. So just, you know, this would be a great time to watch it if you didn't in the first place. And you'll get a sense of what FSH and LH are doing and how they're changing throughout a cycle. But um, I would say the gold standard is, especially in the case of a woman who has a, is still having a period, um, and again, I, the reason I say that is there are women whose periods are very infrequent because of IUDs, but they're technically not still in menopause. Um, but if you can measure FSH and LH and estradiol just to round it out on day five, uh, day, day one being the day the period begins, so five days in, um, that's a very good test. And boy, once that number starts to get to 20 or 25, um, that, that's really the, the, the surefire sign that, that, that a woman is in menopause. Um, but it's important to understand that there's also, you know, if a woman is sitting here and she's not in menopause yet and wondering, well, is that it? Is that the diagnosis? No, of course, again, it's the, the diagnosis is based on amenorrhea. But for many women, they're going to be having symptoms even before they get there. And um, I think it's safe to say that the most common symptoms that women experience are the so-called vasomotor symptoms of hot flashes and night sweats. Those tend to significantly precede other symptoms such as, you know, vaginal dryness, vaginal atrophy, uh, and things of that nature. Uh, and obviously, you know, more significant issues such as uh, loss of bone mineral density. So um, again, looking at the FSH, LH, and estradiol level on that, you know, day five, again, you'll see FSH and LH go up, you'll see estradiol come down, and obviously um, we might start to see symptoms even before that diagnosis of menopause, and we would, of course, refer to those as perimenopausal symptoms. Yeah, and that's a good transition because we also receive questions around if there are other tests that might be indicative of perimenopause. So what do we know about that? The short answer is yes, there is. Uh, we do not use this um, in, in our practice, but I think if you're chasing fertility, you may also be looking at the anti-malarian hormone or AMH. So I think anybody listening to this who has thought about fertility, uh, whether it be through IVF or other means, uh, is probably familiar with this hormone, but it's, it's a hormone that is produced by the granulosa cells of a growing follicle. So, um, so, you know, so small follicles, sort of sub eight millimeter follicles are making this hormone. And the more of this hormone you have, uh, the more ovarian reserve you have. Now, this is actually kind of a, one of those examples where uh, a figure is sometimes worth more than the words because AMH declines precipitously uh, before the onset of menopause. And so knowing your AMH level and knowing both the rate of decline uh, and the absolute level uh, can, can also be predictive. Again, I think this is not necessarily a valuable tool for predicting menopause. Um, and I think that the better use of this is is actually around um, uh, trying to get a better handle on uh, ovarian reserve if uh, reproduction is still in the cards. But if you pull up this figure, Nick, um, you'll, you'll get a sense of how FSH 
LH and AMH are changing in the perimenopausal phase. So uh, for people just listening to us, unfortunately, it's not as powerful, but you have a, a graph here that on the uh, x-axis shows you time. So time zero is the final menstrual period. Therefore, uh, halfway between the zero and the one would be the definition of when you're, you're in menopause, uh, when you enter menopause. And you can see that this graph starts on the left five years before menopause. And five years before menopause, you can see FSH and LH are very low. They're represented by the, uh, <clears throat> the green line for FSH, the blue line for LH. By the way, the dotted lines on either side of the solid lines just show you the 95% confidence intervals. This is very, very tight. And five years prior to menopause, the uh, anti-malarian hormone, the AMH, is very high. So the FSH and LH concentrations are shown on the left y-axis, and the right y-axis shows the AMH concentration. So five years pre-menopause, the uh, AMH concentration is 0 0.6. Uh, the units are nanograms per milliliter, but you know most people would just say 0 0.6 because those are the only units they're typically measured in. The FSH and LH are very low. You know they're going to be you know somewhere between two and five. And just watch what happens as you move from you know basically five years prior to menopause towards menopause. The AMH drops very suddenly. I mean, it's you know within a period of about a year or two, it goes from 0.6 to you know 0.1, uh, and, and certainly less than that. Uh, whereas the FSH and LH kind of rise, and you'll notice that um, you know that FSH LH. Especially, again, remember I said the FSH was the thing I care most about. You can sort of see if you look that the, at that green curve that FSH is hitting 25 right around menopause, maybe even a little bit before. So, so there are a couple of studies, and we'll, we'll link to, uh, to at least one, that do look at the rate of change of AMH as a predictor of menopause. Um, again, we don't do this clinically in our practice. I don't think that means it's not valuable. Um, but, you know, there are uh, certain predictors that come out. Um, so, for example, if your AMH is below 0.2 and you're more than 40, uh, then the probability that you're going to go through menopause in the next five years is very high. Um, but again, <clears throat> you know, the FSH is still valuable. In fact, it's probably necessary to determine how early or late you are in it. Um, you could, I think where the AMH is helpful is when it's high. So if your AMH is above 1.5, um, you know, you're likely not perimenopausal. In fact, even if you're over 40, but your AMH is over 1.5, um, menopause is probably at least six years away. So anyway, I think those are kind of examples of where the AMH can be uh, helpful again, especially as if you're still considering uh, fertility. Peter, earlier you mentioned vasomotor symptoms, and this is something that we see a lot of questions come through on from people. So maybe start with what are the underlying hormonal changes that cause menopausal symptoms like hot flashes? And then from there, maybe discuss what are some hormone replacement therapies that can be used to alleviate those symptoms. Thank you for listening to today's sneak peek AMA episode of The Drive. If you're interested in hearing the complete version of this AMA, you'll want to become a premium member. It's extremely important to me to provide all of this content without relying on paid ads. To do this, our work is made entirely possible by our members. And in return, we offer exclusive member-only content and benefits above and beyond what is available for free. So if you want to take your knowledge of this space to the next level, it's our goal to ensure members get back much more than the price of the subscription. Premium membership includes several benefits. First, comprehensive podcast show notes that detail every topic, paper, person, and thing that we discuss in each episode. And the word on the street is, nobody's show notes rival ours. Second, monthly Ask Me Anything or AMA episodes. These episodes are comprised of detailed responses to subscriber questions, typically focused on a single topic and are designed to offer a great deal of clarity and detail on topics of special interest to our members. You'll also get access to the show notes for these episodes, of course. Third, 
delivery of our premium newsletter, which is put together by our dedicated team of research analysts. This newsletter covers a wide range of topics related to longevity and provides much more detail than our free weekly newsletter. Fourth, access to our private podcast feed that provides you with access to every episode, including AMAs, Sans the Spiel you're listening to now, and in your regular podcast feed. Fifth, the Qualies, an additional member-only podcast we put together that serves as a highlight reel featuring the best excerpts from previous episodes of The Drive. This is a great way to catch up on previous episodes without having to go back and listen to each one of them. And finally, other benefits that are added along the way. If you want to learn more and access these member-only benefits, you can head over to peteratiamd.com forward slash subscribe. You can also find me on YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter, all with the handle peteratiamd. You can also leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever podcast player you use. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take all conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about where I keep an up-to-date and active list of all disclosures. Mm-hmm.